All right, I'm gonna spend the next two weeks talking about the topic of um, church authority. So just authority in the church and some issues and questions surrounding church authority. So hopefully you guys find it interesting, um, some of the points I've got to talk about. Um, but first of all, I just want to say that, you know, authority in a local church, authority in a church body, such as this one here, uh, is ordained by God. So it's not just, you know, a man wants to take control and, you know, wants to ha have rule in the house of God. I mean, God has set up uh, certain offices and he set up a certain structure uh, for a couple of reasons. And we'll go through a couple of those reasons just in the verses we'll see here. But in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse uh, 27 onwards, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And you know, last week we talked about the difference between the body of Christ and the church, which can be called the body of Christ, but is a gathering of people within the body of Christ uh, for the purpose of meeting together for Jesus Christ. And God hath set some in the church. So he's put these things in place in the church, First, apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, uh, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Just an interesting point on that last verse, if you know 1 Corinthians 13 is a chapter that's famous for the chapter of love, you know, charity. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever realized, but you know how it ends off in chapter 12 saying that there are these gifts, there are these positions in a church and, and they have all their reasons and they have all their purposes. But then he says there at the end there, you know, you can covet, so desire these offices, desire these gifts but yet I show unto you a more excellent way. So he actually goes into 1 Corinthians 13 talking about charity, saying that we should desire charity even above authority, above the different spiritual gifts that can be given to different believers. And I just think that, that, that that's interesting that, um, you know, love, how love is emphasized there. And also the fact that it's talking about charity in the, in the local church. You know, the Bible says, you know, that you do good to all men, especially of those that are of the household of faith. Um, so we see here that, you know, there, there are different uh, like positions within the church and, you know, some don't necessarily exist anymore, like apostles, for example. But we see here that there are different positions. They all play their different role. They're all there for a purpose. So God has these different positions. They all play their part. But one thing we see here is that they're not all the same. You know, there, there's all these different parts and all these different members. You know, you read in 1 Corinthians 12, the body being uh, different, uh, different members of a body, but, you know, they're all required. They all play their part. They're all important. And it's the same in, in a local church. Everything is important. But one is not more valuable than another. Just because one person has more authority than another in a church, it doesn't mean that they are more valuable or highly valued in God's eyes. You know, it's like at your workplace. You know, maybe... The, maybe the, the company values them more, and that's why they get paid more, but the, you know, they're not more valuable as a person. They're just another person. They're just another sinner like you are, even though they may be getting paid more than you. They may be in a position of higher authority. So authority does not dictate um, value. And, you know, everyone's different because, you know, God doesn't, if, if God wanted us all the same, he would have created us all the same. He would have created us all to look the same and act the same and talk the same. You know, God doesn't want us to be clones of each other. Um, and often sometimes, you know, you know, sometimes people think that Christianity is this cookie cutter. Everyone needs to look and dress and act and do the same thing. Uh, but no, um, you know, not everybody may have a desire to, to um, you know, be a bishop or a deacon. Um, people have different things that and desires God maybe have, has given them or things that they want to do for God and we can all play a part. You know, one person doing one work for God is not more valuable uh, than somebody else, even though there may be more authority. Just like if you're a bishop or a deacon, you're going to have more authority than just a regular church member. But that doesn't mean a, a regular church member can't do greater things for God. You know, you could go soul winning much more than I do. You could do much more for God with the things you have even though in this local church here, um, I'm, I'm accountable and I have the authority here. Ephesians uh, 4, let's go there. Ah. Uh, 
reading from verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That verse is a bit of a bit of a mouthful. But what I wanted to sort of mention here, and um, you know, this might sound funny coming from me, but you know, we see here that God has given gifts unto men. And part of those gifts are the authority in a church. So apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And you're saying, you know, Victor, are you trying to say that you're, you're God's gift to this church? Well, in a sense, I am. You know, I am God's gift to this church in the sense that God has put an authority in this church and he's given this church a bishop to lead it and to take care of it. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily dictate the value of the gift. The gift just, a gift just means that you didn't do anything to earn it. It's something that God gave to you. Um, you can determine yourself the value of this gift that God has given to you. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, bishops and deacons um, and this authority in the church are, are given, are gifts given to God for certain reasons. And we see here why. It says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, so to perfect us and to, to help us to, to grow in our faith and in our walk, for the work of the ministry. And this is something that's important because a lot of bishops and deacons these days, they, they, they uh, preach and they, and they have that position, but are they doing the work of the ministry? You know, are they helping people grow in their faith? Are they doing the soul winning? Are they getting out there and preaching the gospel and being that example that people can follow um, in terms of reaching souls and reaching the lost for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So not only building you up in your personal life, but actually helping to grow and uh, add people to this body. Um, and why do they do this? Well, we see here later on, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love. So this is how they ought to, to minister grace to the hearers. Uh, they should speak the truth in love and not uh, with hate and not with disdain towards God's people. They grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And I just wanted to mention here, it says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I just want to note there in that verse, it says every joint, every part, because even though God has given pastors and teachers, apostles, prophets and evangelists to perfect, edify the work of the ministry in a church, that's not where it stops. We all play a part in edifying one another. There's, there's a part that everyone needs to play where it says the whole body is fitly joined together and every joint, every member in this body plays a part in edifying this body, um, uh, edifying the body uh, of itself in love, as it says there. <clears throat> so, you know, take that upon yourself. Take that ownership upon yourself that, you know, you can play a part. Don't just leave it to everybody else to uh, build this body up. You're going to play a part as well. And that's why I definitely encourage discussion. I encourage people to get to know one another, have each other over for dinner, because I want this body to be joined together by every part and not everyone just joined to the head, you know, or the, the head that's under the true head, which is um, Jesus Christ. Now, let's just go to Hebrews 13. And we went here last week, but I'll just touch on it quickly. Uh, verse 7 to 9. It says here, remember them which have the rule over you. So, you know, we do rule in the house of God, bishops and deacons. So, you know, sometimes we don't like authority, but God has set this authority in the church. 
And I think as, as Christians, it's something that we need to grow and learn to do, that there are authorities that God has put in our life. And part of that growth in our, in our spiritual life is learning how to submit to the God-ordained authorities in our life, you know, whether it's in the church, whether it's at work, or whether it's at home. Uh, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. So there's one reason why God gives uh, authority in the church, to, to speak unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. So there's the example that needs to be set, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profit of them, that have been occupied therein. Now you remember we saw back in Ephesians 4 that not being tossed about uh, with, uh, you know, to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And the point I just want to make here is obviously God has given authority and, you know, the preachers and teachers and pastors and evangelists in the church to keep you from false doctrine and to keep you safe from false teachers and false doctrines. But the one thing I want to mention here is, you know, you don't go from, you know, let's say you're getting carried about with every winner doctrine and starting to follow this maybe one guy, this false teacher and, and getting off the wrong track. The idea here is not that you stop trusting that man and then start trusting another man. Do you know what I mean? So it's not that, you know, we, it's not that the bishops and deacons that are teaching in a church are keeping you safe by saying, hey, don't trust those guys. Now put your trust on me and, and trust what I'm telling you. Because what a bishop and a deacon is meant to be doing when they teach is pointing you back to the word of God. And that's how we're meant to be keeping you safe and saying, hey, don't trust any man. It doesn't matter how good they sound. You need to you know, test what even I preach by the word of God. And that's what's going to keep you safe. Because if you just transfer your trust from following one man to following the next hot preacher and then following the next hot preacher, you're still building your house on sand and you're not safe. So the way we keep you safe is to remind you and say, hey, you're trusting man, you're following man, you need to get in the Bible, you need to get in the Word of God, know what you believe, why you believe it, and then you'll be safe with God, not putting your trust in a man. So, you know, we see here a couple of reasons, you know, that there's the order that has to be put in place, you know, the example, the safety from false doctrine and false teachers, uh, but don't move from trusting one man to trusting another. Make sure you trust God. 1 Timothy 3. Okay, so there are two positions. There are only two positions of authority in a local church that are uh, mentioned you know, nowadays because I think a lot of them are um, you know, apostles and, and prophets are no longer, in my opinion. So I, I believe that there's only two right now um, in the uh, local New Testament church. And we see the first one here in 1 Timothy 3.1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So there's the office of a bishop. Then we'll read later on in verse 10. And we see the office of a deacon. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And again, we see later on in verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I just wanted to show you this verse here in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So we see the two offices there of authority in the local church. So let's just talk about the office of a bishop first. Acts 20, 28. Now the office of a bishop, so the bishop in a local church I like to think of it as the, the spiritual overseer. I mean, and obviously if there are no deacons in a church, he'll be looking over the physical needs as well. But his main, his main role, uh, in my opinion, is to be the spiritual overseer in the local church. We see here in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And how do we know that that's talking about the bishops? Well, we read uh, earlier on uh, in verse 17, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the 
elders of the church. So Paul in Acts 20 calls the elders of the church there at Ephesus and then he's uh, talking with them, he's about to leave them um, and he, and he uh, basically exhorts them in verse 28 to take heed therefore unto yourselves, so look after your own faith first of all and to all the flock which, over the which the Holy Ghost hath, hath made you overseers. So the elder or the bishop is a spiritual overseer uh, over the flock of God. And, you know, that's what the, the word bishop means, as far as I understand, that the word bishop just means uh, an overseer. You know, pastor means shepherd. Um, bishop means overseer. We see bishop used in the New Testament. I believe this is the only time overseer in the New Testament is used. Okay, Titus. One. So we've got the bishop and the deacon. The bishop is a spiritual overseer. I personally believe that an elder and a bishop is the same thing. So I don't believe a deacon is an elder. I only believe a, a bishop is an elder. I know there are other views out there where there is elder is like another position you can hold and then elders get ordained into bishops or deacons. I guess you could make that make sense as well. So, you know, I'm not totally against that position at all. You know, you could look at the verse and say, well, you know, he ordained elders in every church. The elders were already elders in the church and then they were ordained into the position of bishop and deacon. I personally believe that bishop and elder are the same office. Um, so, so the elders of the church are the bishops. And then you have deacons, which are just uh, people who are hired to look after the physical needs of a church. And the reason why I think that um, is in Titus because the, the words are interchanged. And if you look, if you compare this to Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, you see if any man desires the office of a bishop and then talks about the office of a deacon. So we see the two offices there. In Titus, it only talks about the office of a bishop. So it says here in verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So Paul appointed Titus as an elder, as a bishop in Crete and said, hey, you need to ordain elders in every city as he, he had appointed him. And then he goes on with the qualifications of a bishop. Look, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine and yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to go on with that in this sermon. But that's the reason why I believe elders are only bishops, because in Titus 1, he says, you know, I've ordained you, and then I want you to ordain elders in every city, like I ordained you as a bishop. And then, he's, then he goes on to say, well, a bishop must be blameless, and then he gives the qualifications of a bishop, but he doesn't give the qualifications of a deacon. He doesn't mention a deacon here. And that's the reason why I think only um, bishops are elders, and deacons are not, even though they do have a position of authority and they do oversee certain things. Um, let's have a look here in 1 Timothy 5, verse 17 and 18. It says here in verse 17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy... Oh, sorry, did I read that right? The elders that rule, rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And you say here, is it just saying that you should respect them more than uh, other people in the church? No, because that honor there is talking about um, that they should be supported and they should be paid um, if they need to be. Verse 18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So it says here, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So we see again that elders, bishops in the local church, they rule. They do make decisions and they have authority in the local church. And what I take from this verse is that, you know, there are some elders that may labor in the word and doctrine and there are some elders that may not. So not every elder or bishop necessarily labors in the word and doctrine. They may have other um, responsibilities in the church, not necessarily the teaching and the preaching of God's word. You know, that's fine. So some labor in word and doctrine, uh, some do not. The elders rule in the house of God. But the other thing I wanted to mention here in verse 18 
Yeah, I think it's very clear in this passage that there's nothing wrong with a bishop or a deacon getting paid. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with a well, well, bishop, because you know, we're talking about elders here. There's nothing wrong with a bishop getting paid. And I think it's very clear here that it says that we should, they should be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and in doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And I don't really want to hit on this point too much, but the reason why it'd be, I think it'd be hard to argue that bishops and deacons should not get paid, like it's wrong to pay them or it's wrong for them to get a paycheck from the church, is because this, this whole chapter of 1 Timothy 5 is talking about people getting supported by the local church. I mean, if, if you can read through it yourself later, but it talks about, uh, you know, being widows being taken on and being supported by the church and the qualifications that they need to meet for a church to take care of them. And people might say, no, no, that honor, that the honor that, um, that that passage is talking about in verse 17 and 18 is just giving them respect. But, you know, when it starts to talk about the widows, about taking on the widows, it, look at what it says in verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. You know, so when it talks about later on, you know, taking on a widow and providing for a widow, and then it says later on, if you provide not for his own, especially of those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So when, when, when a widow needs help, you're not just giving her more respect. I mean, you're giving her support, your financial support, helping her, you know, because obviously if her husband has just, has just died and she doesn't have that income, but she's a godly woman that has uh, been part of the church, it's the church's responsibility to take care of her so that she can continue to raise her children and focus on them rather than having to go get a job and then put her kids in daycare. So I think it'd be hard to argue that um, bishops cannot be paid. I mean, uh, you know, not all of them are. I'm not saying a bishop must be paid, but it's definitely not wrong if they are, if they do take a, take a, take a paycheck. Now, the last thing I just want to say here is, you know, it, it's called the office of a bishop. It's not called the office of a pastor. And I know we, we generally refer to it in our modern day colloquial as pastor. And, I, you know, I don't really have a problem with that. I know I sort of make an issue of it. It's not that I have a problem with it. I'm just trying to change our vocabulary because I want to, I want to take the word back. You know, because it is in the, in, a, in the King James Bible, it's the office of a bishop. It's not the office of a pastor. And I just feel like I want to take that word back from the Catholics. Because the only reason why people have an association of the word bishop with the Catholic Church is because the Catholic Church uses it. They use the word bishop and they refer, you know, we don't shy away the, from the word church because the Catholics use it. We don't start calling it something else. You know, we use that word and we just claim it as our own and, and, and um, try and re-educate people on what a bishop really is. He's an he's a, he's a authority in the local true church of Jesus Christ, not a guy, you know, with a big hat and a robe in um, the Catholic Church. So yeah, we, we shouldn't shy away from using the word bishop if that's the word the Bible uses to describe the office. Um, you know, and unfortunately, we've just replaced it. You know, we've shied away from the word generally because of the Catholic Church and we've replaced it with the word pastor instead of just using the word uh, that's used in our Bible. Okay, now many of you know that I, pref I prefer to be called just by my first name. Um, I, don't, I, I don't really prefer to be called, you know, Pastor Tay, Pastor Victor, or Bishop Tay, or Bishop Victor. I know you guys sometimes call, that, call me that just for fun. And, you know, I don't really mind. I'm not going to be upset at you, if, if upset at anybody, if they refer to me that way. But, you know, I prefer just to be called by my first name. And it's not just really just a preference of culture, even though the culture that we, we have in Australia and even the culture in a lot of uh, Asian families is that you... you you generally you want to feel closer to somebody. You wouldn't call somebody by a title. They might say, oh, you know, call them auntie and, auntie and uncle, but the whole idea of calling somebody auntie so-and-so and uncle so-and-so is because you're trying to be part of their family. You're trying to be closer. So even though, you know, just in my own, my own personal opinion, apart from the Word of God, you know, I prefer to just be called by my first name because I feel as though if you call me Pastor Victor or if you call me, you know, Bishop Tay or whatever, I feel that I'm being lifted up above you, um, and, and I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be on your same level. You know, I know I have authority, but I don't need to be on this ivory tower above everybody. But the reason why I prefer not to be called 
Pastor Tay or Pastor Victor is because, I, you know, at the end of the day, I like to do things the way I see it in the Bible. You know, and isn't that how should we do everything? I like to do things the way that I see it in the Bible. And to be honest, I don't see any precedence at all in the New Testament of calling church authority by a title. So calling somebody bishop so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, deacon so-and-so, evangelist so-and-so. I mean, there isn't any precedence at all. You can't point to any scripture in the New Testament which even shows that this is how people refer to authority or even how they refer to each other that way. And I just want to show you a couple of verses there. I'd say the only way, only thing you can see in the Bible where people are referred to by a title are the kings, King Saul, King David. That's the only things I could find. If you can find others, uh, uh, let me know. But uh, just let me show you a couple of verses real quick on this point. Because I know you guys th know that this is my preference, and I just wanted to explain my reasoning behind why that's my preference. Uh, this is one passage where Peter is referring to Paul, and he says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written, unto you. Now I know sometimes in the local church we refer to each other as brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. I honestly think that comes from American tradition. I don't think it's something that they necessarily got from the Bible. I mean this is probably the only verse you can find where brother and name is put together and that's how we call people as opposed to just saying that they are our brother and our sister. Yeah, they are our brother and our sister but does that mean we need to call them brother so-and-so? I don't have a problem with it I'm just saying that's, I'm just trying to show you that it's a tradition that is passed down. You don't need to feel that if you don't do it, you're somehow sinning or going against God's word. And you might say, well, isn't that verse using it in that sense? It's saying, even as our beloved brother, Paul. Well, I don't even know if this verse is really calling him brother Paul or more saying that he's our beloved brother named Paul. You know, so you could, you could read that verse two different ways and, and maybe there's no comma there, so you could say, oh, it is Brother Paul. But then brother is not capitalized, so that's, you know, it's not really his name. Unlike John the Baptist, I believe Baptist is capitalized. So um, anyway, so that, that's Peter referring to Paul, saying Brother Paul, but he could just be saying that Paul is our beloved brother, as, opposing him, as opposed to giving him the title of Brother Paul, all one, one phrase. Um, now look here in 1 Peter 5, it says here, In the elders which are among you, so we already talked about these being the bishops, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So this verse shows that Peter the apostle was an elder as well in a church. He was a bishop of, of a local church. Paul was not a bishop. Paul was an apostle, so he had the authority to ordain bishops, but he, you know, he traveled around and um, wasn't uh, an authority in a, in a certain local body like Peter was. And if we see in 2 John, it says here, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. So John, not only in 2 John, but also in 3 John, refers to himself as the elder. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. But look here in Galatians 2.9 when Paul is referring to um, his encounter at the Galatian church in um, uh, Galatians 2, he says here, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But then when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now what do you notice here in this story that he's recounting? Is he's referring to everybody by their first name. He's not saying, and when Pastor James and Pastor Cephas and Pastor John, uh, who seemed to be pillars, and he said, when, and when, when Peter was come to Antioch, so he's not saying when Pastor Peter was come to Antioch, he doesn't refer to them by their title, he's just referring to them by their first name. And this is how they referred to one another. This is, I think, the, the example we see in the Bible. So if the apostles didn't even refer to each other by title. Why would we refer to them?
by their title. And, you know, we even think of them, we'll say things like uh, the Apostle Paul. You know, and what we mean by that, it's Paul the Apostle. But the Apostle Paul, that phrase is never found in the Bible. It's just Paul and Apostle. Um, Paul the Apostle and the Apostles and whatnot, um, as, as far as I can tell. Um, but you may say, well, you know, what about in, uh, you know, 2 John and in 3 John, where John, he refers to himself as the elder, and he says, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. It doesn't that give us a precedence to call people pastor or call people by a title. Well, number one, it's not somebody else referring to him. He's referring to himself, and he could just be identifying himself, saying the elder, just like Paul did. You know, Paul said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and things like that. Did, does that mean that he's insisting that um, people call him by the title, Apostle Paul or John? Did he want to be called Elder John? You know, like the Mormons do? <laughs> Maybe he wouldn't want to in this day and age. He wouldn't want to be thought of as a Mormon. But, um, you know, I don't think that's what he's insisting, to be called Elder John. He's just saying that he was an elder, just like Paul was saying he was an apostle, just noting to them his office. So, you know, I, you know I, 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 it's, it's not honestly a big issue, but, you know, it's just because it's something different. I just like to explain to you guys my reasoning behind it. But, you know, do I have a problem with something, somebody wanting to be called by a title? No. If somebody wants to be called by a title, then they can do... They can be called by whatever they want. They can give themselves whatever title they want. Um, you know, so I don't have a problem with somebody wanting to be called by a title. Um, I don't have a problem with somebody... Uh, I don't have a problem with calling somebody by a title if that's what they prefer. Like if, so, if, if there's a bishop of a church and he prefers to be called pastor so-and-so or you know, bishop so-and-so or there's an evangelist or a you know, traveling preacher that wants to be called evangelist so-and-so and, and I know that if I don't call him pastor so-and-so he's going to get upset hey, I'm happy to concede and just respect his opinion and just call him by the name he wants to be called. It's like if you had a name, like, let's say, like Timothy. And let's say he grows up and he prefers to be called Tim and, and then you keep calling him Timothy, you know that gets on his nerves. I mean, that's not really being very loving, is it? If you're calling him something that you know, uh, like, irks him the wrong way, you just call him by the name that he prefers, uh, which is Tim. And that's how I kind of do things in my family. You know, I, I tend to, with my children, you know, I don't mind if my children call people by their first name as long as they're okay with it. So what I teach my children is, you know, with, with people in authority, people that are older than them, um, what I'm going to teach them is, you know, you ask them how they want to be addressed and you address them that way, um, you know, rather than just giving them one blanket way of addressing everyone. Because the reason why I decided to do it that way is because, um, you know, let's say, for example, in Asian culture, you may teach your children to call everyone auntie so-and-so, uncle so-and-so. But then there are some ladies that may not want to be called auntie so-and-so because they don't want to be called, like, they don't want to be the older, they want to be on the same level. So I just thought it was it's safer that way. I just, we, we just ask them, hey, how do you want my children to address you? And then I'll teach my children to address them that way. And then it'll just become their name, right? It's like, like with my dad. Like he wants my children to call him Gong Gong, which is, with, which is grandpa in, in, in Chinese. So now they just know his name is Gong Gong. So that, that, that's how I plan to do it in my family, but um, that's the reasoning behind that. So I don't have a problem with calling somebody by a title. That's their preference. And I'll respect their opinion uh, if it isn't a sin, if it's not a commandment, I'm breaking the Bible. Um, but do I have a problem with someone claiming that titles are biblical? Yes, I do have a problem with that because, you know, in, just in general, I have a problem with people preaching their opinions and, you know, their preferences as commandments and doctrines. Um, so that's why I have a problem with it because I have a problem with people taking their opinions and imposing them as commandments of God. So I do have a, pr a problem with somebody uh, insisting that it is biblical when it's not. All right, let's just talk about uh, the office of a deacon for a bit. So let's go to Acts uh, 6. Now, I believe the office of a deacon is purely uh, an overseer over physical matters. Um, so, kind of like how the bishop and the elder was a spiritual overseer, the deacon is like a physical overseer over physical needs in the church. And now, even though in Acts 6, I don't know if you guys realize this, but the, the word deacon is never used. Um, but a lot of people just believe that Acts 6 is the appointment of the first seven deacons. But 
You really couldn't prove it. I, I think it's reasonable to assume that these are the deacons because of what they were appointed to do. But I just wanted to make that point there that you know, it's, it doesn't actually say that they were deacons. We, we just believe they are. And that is my position. I do believe that this was the appointment of the first seven deacons. And I would build my understanding of what a deacon is on this passage. Acts 6 verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the daily service of uh, whatever they were doing there, whether it was food or whatnot. <clears throat> it might have been even the daily ministration of giving out you know, their, their, their funds, you know, to, to, to give them their money for what they needed to do. Um, and there just was too much to do that uh, some were being neglected. So we see here that it's a, it is a physical need, the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So we see there the comparison between the spiritual oversight, the preaching of God's word, and um, you know the spiritual aspect and things that need to be done in church versus the physical things that need to be done in church, the serving of tables, the food, the basic uh, physical necessities. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So we see there that the deacons, they were an overseer. They were appointed and ordained over this business. So they have authority uh, in that regard. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte, of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. You know, and this is why we, 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 we want to be able to pay bishops and deacons, because we see here when the bishops were, had too much to do, they couldn't keep up with everything. Um, and that was taking them away from the Word of God, from prayer, from the ministry of the Word, which is also the soul winning as well. That includes the ministry of the Word. And when they put, appointed these deacons into place, look at the result of what happened. And, uh, and the Word of God increased. So even more so the Word of God was getting out there. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now that suggests to me that without the deacons, it's almost like there was a limit on how much they could do. But when they appointed these deacons to take away the, the admin of the church, there was so much more that the bishops could do. And that's why anybody that says that, you know, bishops can't be paid and do this full time, it's, it's almost like they're limiting the work that God could do. Because right now I could keep up. You know, I can keep up with everything. It's not always easy. But keeping up with just running this church and running you know all the different group events and things like that and 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 studying to preach the word of god but i'm sure there will come a point where i wouldn't be able to keep up with it and we're going to need to to either put deacons in place or i'm going to have to quit my job and be supported full time so that this church can flourish because um, we don't want to put a, a a limit on there so I believe this is the appointment of the first seven deacons. You might say, oh, do we see a church vote here? Because we're saying, we say, remember we talked about, well, you know, you know that I'm against church voting and we don't have any votes. But we see here that, you know, they said, hey, go look out among you, uh, men of honest report. And then they brought them before the disciples. Is this a church vote here? Um, well, no, not necessarily. I think it's just the fact that the church is recommending these men because ultimately the apostles could decide whether or not to ordain them or not because they could put these people before the apostles, the apostles could say, no, that's not somebody that meets the qualifications of a deacon. Um, so I guess they, they, it, this, I think, is just them getting the opinion of the church. And I think that's good for any authority to do that, you know, whether it's authority in the church or whether it's authority in your own family. You know, I don't make decisions without the counsel of my wife, but does that mean my wife makes the decisions? No, I make the decisions, but I may get her opinion and get her view on things, and then that can work into 
what I decide. And it's the same in this church. You know, I, I listen to you guys and if there's different ways we can do things. Does that mean that you guys make the decision? No, I'm going to make the decision, but I still listen to what you guys have to say and the input that you have. Now, we're not going to turn back to, um, you know, Titus, uh, 1 Timothy 3, but all of us are aware here that you know, the office of a bishop and the office of a deacon, they need to be the husband of one wife. So they're always men. Bishops and deacons are not women. So, you know, you can call, you can call a, a woman that's, you know, an authority in a church, whatever you want, but, you know, I will never accept her as a bishop or a deacon because you cannot, you cannot be a bishop or a deacon if you're a woman, just plain and simple. God is not going to see you as a bishop or a deacon. But what the point I wanted to make here was, you know, deacons were only men because deacons were basically the church employees. You know, the, the, ch the church, a, a paid church worker who was in authority um, and they were always men. So the way I look at it is, you know, the, we read in 1 Timothy 15 about the widows. So it's not wrong to have paid church workers that are women. You know, so you can have an admin person or receptionist or you know, whatever, if your church is that big and requires it. Or you have, you know, a widow that is, um, you know, over 60 and, and she, you, you, you support her and she does work in the church and she's paid, she's on the church payroll. So it's not wrong to have, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have women employees for a church, but what I do believe is that it's wrong for a woman to be an employee of a church and that position in the church is a position of authority. So you can, I, I believe you can have uh, women as church workers, but when you look at appointing, the, the, so I guess what you'd call the managers over those church workers, I believe God's intention is that they should always be men. Because I believe God's intention in the local church is that men are in authority. Men rule the house of God, so why would he want a manager over people, because remember the deacons are overseers as well. They, they are appointed over this business. If God didn't want men to be authority in the church, why would he want men being appointed to be an authority over other men and managing them and telling them what to do, as opposed to just being uh, on the entry level? So that, that's how I take it. So it's not wrong for a church to have paid women workers, but I see it as you know the managers which are what the deacons are. They're like the managers of the church people and the practical needs are always men because I believe God's intention is that men rule the house of God. So that's what an office, the office of the deacon, it's the physical needs of the church as opposed to the spiritual needs. Now, just on that note, why, why do I believe church leaders should not be women? I mean, we see here that church leaders shouldn't be women. It just says that in the Word of God. But uh, let me just go through a few things on what the Word of God says and why I believe God does not have women uh, to rule the house of God and does not have women to be authority uh, in the house of God. So two things I want to cover. One is, number one, they're, they're all, women are ordained to be a follower and they are ordained to have authority over them. That's just how God has it from the very beginning. Genesis 3.16. After Adam and Eve had, <coughs> had sinned and God pronounced the curse, look at what it says here in verse 16. He says, Unto the woman, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So I don't know what it was like before, you know, uh, the Garden of I guess, you know, maybe they were more on equal authority before she sinned. Um, but after Adam and Eve sinned, part of the curse was that the woman's desire would be to her husband and that now she would always have an authority that would rule over them. So if you're a, an unmarried woman, it would be uh, your, your, your father and if you're a married woman, it would be your husband. So it's ordained from the very beginning uh, for women to have authority over them. And not, not only that, but in... Um, in Genesis 1, uh, verse, 
18. Oh, was it Genesis? Oh, no, that's not Genesis 1. I put the wrong... Um, Ah, oh, where was that? Where's that verse where it says, "I'll make an help meet for him"? Does anyone remember where it was? I'm, I'm, I'm blanking right now. Mm. Is it chapter two? Okay, so maybe it was two. Oh, okay, it's two eighteen. So I think I put one eighteen. Okay, I've got chapter one eighteen in my notes. It's cha uh, chapter two eighteen. Okay, it says here in chapter 218, And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help me for him. So we see there in Genesis 2 verse 18 that the woman, the whole reason why she was created was to be a helper for the man. And it wasn't the other way around. One thing I just want to note on this verse is that God said he would make and help meet for Adam, meaning that he would make Adam a helper that was suitable for him. Not that he would make Adam a help meet, because you know a lot of people would call the wife a, a help meet. <laughs> I don't think that's actually a word, that's just them joining those two words together. But he's saying here, I will make him a help or a helper suitable, um, suitable for him. Uh, Ephesians 5. 22 it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So I take that to mean that anything your husband asks you to do, if it's not sinning against God, a wife should obey it even if it's just a husband's preference. It says that, uh, that they should be subject to them, um, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So we see there that the husband is the head of the wife. This is how God has ordained it. God has ordained the woman to have authority over her. He's ordained her to be a follower. And why has he done it that way? Uh, let's see in 1 Timothy 2. So there's no question about it that God has ordained uh, women to have authority over them and that's just how God has done it. And that should be enough for us. If God has ordained it that way, that should just be the way we do it. But let's think about the reasoning why God did it that way. Um, and we read here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's just read from verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So we read that in Genesis, that Eve was formed to be a helper for Adam and not the other way around. Adam was formed first, then Eve was formed by the, the rib of Adam. Adam was first formed, then Eve. But look, this, this is why I believe God does not have women in authority in the local church. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So why do I believe God has appointed man to be the ruler in the house of God? He's, he's appointed man to be authority over the woman. Why? Because I believe God knows because of Eve that there is a tendency for women to be more emotional, to be more driven by their lust, to be more driven by their desires, and that makes them a bit more unstable in terms of holding fast for, to the truth, and they're more easily deceived. The Bible says here in verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, am, am I saying that every woman is more easily deceived than every man? No, but I'm just saying that in general, you know, women are more easily deceived and more carried about with strange doctrines because they are ordained to be a follower. That's part of the curse. They follow people, so they are easily follow men and they get carried about with different things. I mean, how many times have I heard stories of couples that are together, they're not married yet, and, and, a, and a woman, she's a natural follower, right? So she likes this guy and she, you know, she starts to take all his positions, but then when that relationship doesn't work out, then they 
you know, they get back with their friends or they get back with another guy that has totally different positions and now they're totally changed. Like the positions that they were so solid on before when they were with one guy are now totally different when they're with another guy. And, and to me, that's just an example. It's anecdotal, I know, but it's an example of women easily being tossed to and fro. It is a generalization. It's just that, you know, you can generalize that men are stronger than women. But is every man stronger than every woman? No, because you, you probably, you know, get some woman that has, you know, trained up and whatever that can probably beat any, most men in an arm wrestle. But that's not normal. That's, 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 a, that's an exception. So this is why I believe women are not meant to be in a position of authority because they're easily deceived, more easily deceived. God doesn't want them especially, you know, teaching the word of God. And that's why the Bible says here, when the teaching is going on in church, that women are to learn in silence and he doesn't suffer. He doesn't allow women to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Because why? Verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Let's just go back to Genesis 3 and just see that time where the woman got deceived in Genesis 3 at the beginning. Let's just read from verse uh, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. A couple of things I just want to mention there. So we see that the tree was good for food. She saw that the tree was good for food. So we see the lust of the eyes, and that it was uh, pleasant to the eyes. Uh, and, then, and then a tree to be desired to make one wise. So a lot of people say we see that she saw that the tree was good for food, so there's the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that the, the lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. There's the, the pride of life uh, that's mentioned in James. Was it James or John? Maybe it's John. Um, so you see there that the woman was deceived because she was drawn away you know, I guess emotionally, or her desires, right? It led her to, to be deceived by the serpent, where Adam was not deceived. You know, Adam ate of the fruit, knowing full well that he was sinning against God. And, you know, just one thing I just want to say here is, you know, somebody said, said to me and Elizabeth recently, I'm not going to say who it was, but somebody said to us recently that, you know, the story in Genesis was, you know, Eve, she was like this temptress, you know, and, and she, she ate of the fruit of the tree and then she actually, you know, tempted Adam into to eating of the fruit of the tree. I remember when they said this to us, I was like, I don't remember reading that in the Bible, Eve being this temptress and tempt tempting Adam to, to eat of the fruit. Because really that whole story is in one verse. It's, you know, that's here, here it is here. She, she ate of the fruit and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. I don't remember reading anything about her tempting him. But the reason why that theory or that story, I think, is, is kind of silly is because, number one, this is before the fall. Remember, they, they were naked? They were always naked. So what's the temptation there? And they were already husband and wife, so they're already sleeping together and, and, and doing what husband and wife does. So, so why would there be any temptation? And you say, well, maybe she was abstaining from Adam. But then this is before sin. And abstaining from your husband is a sin. So is that her first sin? I thought her first sin was eating of the fruit. So there's just many reasons why that story is, is quite silly. But I just think it's funny that, um, that, that that was said to us. I was like, I don't remember seeing that in the Bible. So no, there wasn't this, this temptation of Eve to, to get Adam to eat the fruit. It was Eve that was deceived. Adam was not deceived into eating the fruit. He wasn't tempted into eating the fruit. He ate the fruit knowing full well that he was rebelling against um, God. 1 Corinthians 11 <clears throat> Again, we see here in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ <coughs> is God. Let's jump down to verse 7. For a man indeed not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. 
Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. And you read that verse and you say, is, 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 is Paul just one for tongue twisters? Because, you know, he's got his Romans 7 passages and things that I would, I do not, do not, would, would. And this is like another one. It's like, man, is not a woman, woman of the man. And you just, you, you start reading through this and you're like, okay, I'm lost. I don't know what Paul is talking about anymore. Um, but let me just explain it to you briefly, a couple, what he's saying here. He's saying here that the man is not of the woman, uh, but the woman of the man. Because he's saying that the woman, I believe he's talking about creation, the woman was created from the rib of man, and the, it's not that the man was created from, from woman. So that whole Adam was formed first, and Eve um, was second. Uh, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So remember we talked about the woman being created as a helper for the man, and not the other way around. Um, the, the man was not created to assist the, the woman, the woman was created to assist the man. So there's the for the woman, but the woman for the man. Let's jump down to verse 11. Never, nevertheless, so what is he saying here? Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. What I believe he's talking about here is the fact that man is born of woman, right? Neither the woman without the man, saying that both are necessary for a birth to take place. That's what I think it's talking about. So it's saying you can't have another man without the woman, because women give birth to children, but a woman can't give birth without the seed of man. So they're both needed. So it's just showing here that, yes, in verse uh, 9, or verse 8 and 9 and 10, it's saying that, yes, women are under authority, but, it's, but they just have different roles. They're not differing in value. They have a different role to play, and that's why he's saying they're both important. Because you can't have more men without women, and you can't have more women without men. They both need each other um, there. Verse 12, For as the woman is of the man, so even so is the man also by the woman in all things. So just reiterating that again. So that's how I understand that passage. A couple of interesting things I just want to mention in this passage that hopefully you find interesting. Number one, in verse 7, it says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, did you know that man was made in the image of God, but not women? Women were not made in the image of God. So it says here that the man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. And I believe that this is a false teaching that people are trying to uh, promote, and even the new Bible versions, because they've changed Genesis 1.27 to say something different. But look at what it says in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So what is him? Him is singular. So he created the man in God's image. Male and female created he them. So man was created in God's image because God is a male. And man was created in God's image because men are males. And to be honest, I don't think I would want females to be created in God's image because I, I think I like the way my wife looks and I like the fact that she's created a woman and she's not in the image of, uh, of God. Um, so man was created in the image of God, uh, not both of them. And you know what's, how this verse has been changed in other Bibles? You can look it up in the NIV. I don't know if it's in other Bibles too. But it says, in the image of God created he them male and female created he them so they've changed that him to them to say that both women and men are created in the image of god and sometimes that's used to promote well they're both in the image of god why aren't they both equal you know or they might say i, I don't know what this religion was that came to my door but it seems to be popular amongst the koreans that god is a mother that god is a woman and they'll say that there is a woman part of God. And we see here, because male and female were created in the image of God, so if a female is created in the image of God, doesn't God then have a female count, a, a female part? And it reminds me of you know, the, the documentary Marching Desire, the Shekinah Gloria. It's like the, the, the female aspect of God. And the, I guess there truly is nothing new under the sun. You know, the Jews, the, 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 what, the, the religion of Judaism is promoting this female side of God, the Shekinah Gloria. 
Um, but there are other religions out there too trying to feminize God. And I believe that's blasphemous because God is a man. He's our father in heaven. Man is created in God's image, not female. And, you know, the King James Bible makes that distinction in Genesis 1.27. The other Bibles do not. Uh, even though in 1 Corinthians 11, the Bible still say that the man is created in the image of God and the woman is the glory of the man. So they've got a little bit of a contradiction there if man and woman was created in the image of God. <coughs> and, you know, the thought I was having when I was thinking this out, you know, the fact that man is created in the image of God and not woman, um, it made me think of this thing that's going around in the media now of Bruce Jenner. Um, I don't know if you guys know about it, but um, maybe you've seen it on Facebook and things like that. But Bruce Jenner, or now known as um, Caitlyn Jenner, is um, the reason why I was thinking of it is because, you know, man is creating the image of God, but I was thinking, well, maybe Caitlyn Jenner is the only, you know, woman that's created in the image of God because he's, he's really a man. But, but if you don't know the story, Bruce Jenner, um, I, I don't even know who he is. I, I, I hear he's some sports star. Uh, was he was he like an, an an NFL player or something like that? He was like an I think he was like an American footballer or something like that. He's a sports star, so he's he's like the the manliest of men uh, that you can imagine uh, playing sport. But then what did he do? He went and mutilated himself to turn him to make himself look like a woman, and now he wants everyone to call him Caitlyn Jenner. Um, and I just think that's, that's really disgusting. But, you know, even, even though, you know, I, it doesn't matter how much Bruce, how, much, how many surgeries or how much paint or how much Photoshop that Bruce Jenner does to himself, himself, not herself, because it's a man. I will, ne I will never accept Bruce Jenner as a woman because it doesn't matter how, how much surgery you have and how much body modification you have, he will never turn himself from a man into a woman. Yeah, he, now he's just a, a man that looks like a woman. He's not a woman, uh, just a man that looks like a woman. And you know, that's what homosexuals, that's what they try and do. They just want people to accept them. If you think about the whole gay marriage debate, the gay marriage debate right now isn't even about rights because they, have, they can do all the things that married couples do. The only thing that they don't have is legal acceptance. And that's what they're trying to force onto the Australian people is that the Australian government would recognize their perverted relationship as a marriage. But you know what? You can convince 51% of the Australian population that your perverted relationship is marriage, but that's not going to make me accept that perverted relationship as marriage. So it doesn't matter if you convince 51% of Australians, you're not going to convince me and I just hope that sticks it to them because, you know, it's kind of like uh, Mordecai not willing to bow. I'm not willing to bow because you can convince everybody that what you have there, that perverted relationship, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it marriage. I'm not going to accept it as marriage. And it's the same with Bruce Jenner. He can call himself Caitlyn. He can put on a pair of breasts and he can, you know, put on a skirt and have all that surgery. But Bruce Jenner is still a man even if he changes his name uh, to Caitlin. You know, it's kind of like, you know, buying a bad car. You know, how many of you have tried to buy a car and then you take it, you know, I did it once, I was trying to buy a, a, a I can't remember what it was, some Nissan car. And it looked great on the outside. Like it was, it was you know, it looked new and it looked like it had been taken care of. And then I took it to, to our mechanic and he checked it out, you know, under the bonnet and checked it out underneath and actually looked at the wiring and looked at all the pipes and everything like that. And he said to me, you know, Victor, I recommend you not to buy this car because I know this car has been in, in a major accident because he can tell underneath, I don't know what he saw, but he knew that this car had probably been totaled or written off or had it been in a huge accident and it had just been made to look nice on the outside. And that reminds me of this situation. You know, you can make a man look like a woman on the outside but that's not what, that's not going to change the gender that they were actually uh, born. You know, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, truth is truth. And it's the same with gay marriage. You know, you can call it marriage. It's not marriage. It's just a perverted relationship of a man and a man or a woman with a woman. Um, and, you know, they might say, oh, that's hate. You know, that's bigotry. That's discrimination. I, I just prefer to call it uh, 
Bible believing. Anyways, a bit of a rabbit trail there. But uh, verse 10, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention here. So we saw that the man is the head of the woman. Man is created in God's image. Oh, that's how we got on that sort of rabbit trail. Man is created in God's image. Uh, woman is not created in man's image, uh, in God's image. She's created as the glory of the man. I want to just point out verse 10 here. It says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, there's a bit of dispute over what this verse actually means in terms of the sons of God in Genesis and were they angels that married women and blah, blah, blah. Um, or were they just, uh, you know, unbelieving uh, men that slept with women? You know, I, I was pretty, I was pretty um, set in my ways that it was not angels, but I, I think I'm starting to be convinced the other way. But, um, and maybe I'll touch on that on another time. But what I wanted to get here, you know, there are differing views on what this verse means, but it's interesting there that it says here that the woman should have authority on her head because of the angels. Now, why would a woman need authority on her head because of angels? Well, I believe it's because angels, the demons, you know, uh, the bad angels are out there to deceive, you know, the deceiving spirits. And this is why the woman is meant to have power on her head because, you know, what we mentioned, that a woman is more easily deceived. A woman is more easily drawn away by every wind of doctrine, that that's why she has authority on her head because there are angels out there trying to deceive us. And this is just going back to my first point. This is the reason why women are not meant to be an authority in church. So number one, they're ordained to be a follower. They're ordained to have authority on their head. Why? Because they're more easily deceived. And we see that the nature of women in Genesis. Um, and we see also here in Corinthians that uh, that's why she needs to have authority on her head because there is something to be worried about uh, because of the angels and what they do. <clears throat> now the last point I just want to make um, before we break for lunch is um, just this issue of uh, women keeping silence in church. I just want to touch on this and just clarify a few things. Now in 1 Corinthians 14, we read here in verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to, one, to, to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, that ye may all prophesy one by one, and that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So just touching on what we were covering before, they are commanded to be in subjection to an authority. But if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, this is often a controversial passage because people say, oh, you know, do Christians believe that women should just go to church and shut their mouth and they can't say anything while they're at church and just be this silent ornament of a meek and quiet spirit? Um, you know, no, I don't believe this is what this verse is teaching. And if you see the, um, the context of this passage, it's talking about the time of teaching in the church. Because number one, remember we, we talked about last week that the church is not the building. So this, this house here that I live in is not, not a church. So when a woman enters this house, it's not saying that a woman needs to keep silent in this building. Um, the church is obviously this gathering here when we gather together and assemble as one body. Um, but is it even saying that a woman needs to be silent during the whole gathering, during, during the whole church gathering? No, it's just saying that she has to be silent during the preaching. So she learns in silence as we see in Timothy. And I just want to show you that, that, that um, context here. Look, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath the psalm, hath the doctrine, hath the tongue, hath the revelation, 
has an interpretation. So what's happening here? They're teaching each other, right? They're teaching each other doctrine. They're maybe speaking in different languages. They have a psalm that has a doctrine. Um, so they're, they're, they're teaching one another here. Um, and it says here, uh, you know, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or the most by three, and, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no, no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets, so there we go, these are the, the, the preachers in the church, the, the people that are teaching the church, speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So it's saying here, don't talk, you don't talk over one another. There's order in the church. You let somebody finish before you um, raise your voice and, and say something. For you may all prophesy or teach one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Then it goes on to say in verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. So is it saying there that women just can't say anything at all during church? No, it's just saying when the teaching is going on, it's not a place for a woman to teach or a woman to raise her voice. It's, it's only the place of the men to teach and to preach the word of God. Because it goes back to this principle of women being easily deceived, that men are ordained in the house of God to rule and to teach the word of God in the house of God. Now let's just go over to 1 Timothy 2. So we say that, saw there in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 that women are to keep silence in the churches. And I believe it's saying there that, you know, women only uh, should be silent during the teaching and the preaching part of church. And I think that uh, not only, the reason why I believe that is it, it's sort of clarified here in 1 Timothy 2, because it says here, let the woman learn in silence. So it's not saying that the woman is just silence all, silent all the time. It's just saying when the learning is happening, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So we see there that it's the learning in silence. It's not that a woman just comes to church and can't say anything at all. Let's just compare that back, the learning in silence, to 1 Corinthians 14. And we see, let your women keep silence in the churches, verse 34, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And look here. And if they will learn anything, so it's the learning, the context is the learning and the teaching and preaching of God's word. Let them ask of their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So what does that mean? So that means when the preaching is going on, women are meant to be silent. They're not meant to raise their hand and ask questions. So, you know, as ladies here, you know, don't ask questions during the teaching and preaching. I am fine with you asking questions afterwards. Um, I think it's ideal, though, that you ask your husband at home, and it's ideal that the husband knows the answer, you know, uh, and is able to clarify for the wife, and she doesn't need to ask somebody else in church. But some people, you know, don't have a husband that is very knowledgeable on the Word of God, or, you know, maybe they don't have a saved family or don't have a saved husband. That's fine to ask me or any of the people uh, after church and have things clarified, but not when we're assembled together uh, as, a, as a church body here. Um, so, you know, don't, obviously, you know, women don't teach. So that's why we'll never have a woman preacher at church. We'll never have a woman teach. Um, you know, women shouldn't ask questions, um, but also women shouldn't voice their opinion during the preaching. So sometimes men will say, amen, or that's right. I believe it's wrong for a woman to do that. It's a wrong for a woman to voice up um, because she's meant to be silent during uh, the preaching. Um, and that's how it is. So what can a woman do? So, you know, I believe that women can, can pray, you know, because that's not the time of teaching. We have a time of prayer. Women can pray. Sometimes we have prayer meetings on weekday nights when we go around the circle and everyone prays and women pray too. I mean, to be honest, I'm fine with women praying even on Sunday mornings. You know, then you might ask, well, Victor, why haven't you ever asked a woman to pray on Sunday mornings? Well, it's because I, I don't know whether you guys would want to pray on Sunday mornings because generally the, uh, the women are a bit, you know, I know that you guys are a bit more shy. If you want to, you know, that's fine. I'm happy to, to have a woman pray on a Sunday morning. I just figured you ladies were a bit more, more shy and uh, would be a bit more uh, you know, shy on a Sunday morning because there are people that here that you don't know as well and having to pray in public. Um, I know some women feel that way. 
<laughs> so, you know, that's, that's why I, I just asked the men to do it. It's just logistically a bit easier. I know they're happy to pray and, and I just give it to them. And since we only have uh, one or two people praying, you know, I want somebody to pray in a loud voice that is confident praying for this uh, body here, this church here. So I'm happy with a woman praying. You know, I don't have a problem with a woman praying on Sunday morning. You know, I don't have a problem with women publicly speaking in a non-church gathering. So for example, if a, if a woman is giving a business lecture or she's teaching a group of women about something to do in the kitchen or teaching a group of women about homeschooling, um, even the Sunday school setting, or like say a women have a, have a, um, uh, like, a, like, a, like a ladies meeting or a ladies afternoon or an afternoon tea, you know, they have their tea parties or whatever, and, and somebody gets up and teaches those ladies the word of God. Um, or even in a Sunday school when it's only, you know, little children, it's a purpose, you know, of little children and not everyone's gathered. Why don't I classify those gatherings as church? Well, the reason why I, I classify it that way is because ch I believe church is a gathering of every believer. And if, if some believers are excluded from that gathering, I don't think that's church anymore. So if you say, well, we're going to gather together, but only the men are invited, that's just some men event that you're having that's not church because church is when, hey, everyone comes. Now, if it just happens to be all men, then that's church. But if you've made it a point to say, no, it's only men, it's only women, it's only young couples, it's only married couples, it's only children, well, that's not church anymore. So I wouldn't necessarily condemn like a Sunday school teacher that has a group of kids and she's teaching the Bible stories and things like that and saying, oh, you Jezebel, you're usurping authority over a man. I just think that isn't church, you know, because you, 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 adults are not welcome to just come there and, and be there. And, and if adults were part of that gathering, she probably wouldn't be teaching the things she was teaching because that's geared towards children. Um, and you'd probably have a man teach men. So, you know, work, you know, hobbies, ladies meetings, kids clubs, Sunday school teachers. Um, I don't think it's a problem for women to be the speaker there or the expert in that field. Um, you know, so, but women, you know, women can make noises. You know, when you say silence in the church, you know, you can, you can laugh and things like that. I mean, that's not, because it's saying, keep silence, saying you don't teach and speak as opposed to, you know, laugh. You know, singing is not the time of teaching. So yeah, women sing uh, in the congregational singing. They, they can sing in church. They can laugh in church. You know, you can make, you can make body noises. You know, like you can make, you know, before you assume what those body noises are, I'm, I'm talking about like coughing and sneezing. You don't have to be like, <coughs> just because you're worried about making a noise in church. So obviously you can make, you know, natural noises. Um, but obviously you don't make those natural noises if you're trying to say something. Like, you know, people will be like, <coughs> or they'll be like, <coughs> so, you know, obviously you don't do that. You're trying to say something with a body noise. So, I hope you learned something there today. So, just to recap what we covered. So, you know, God ordained authority in the local church um, for many reasons. Uh, and there are two positions of authority, the bishop and the deacon. And, and these are always men. Um, and why are they men? Because, you know, women are not ordained to be in authority. Why? I believe it's because they're just more easily deceived and God wants stability um, and strong leadership in the house of God. Um, and women, you know, they can make noise in church. They're just not ordained to preach and to teach. And that's why they should keep silent during their teaching and preaching of God's word.